Hi everyone, for this video recording, we're going to talk now specifically about the plasma membrane permeability. We have seen that the outer boundary of a cell is the plasma membrane, which can also be called the cell membrane or even the plasma lemma. It is extremely thin and delicate and has four main functions. The physical isolation, the regulation of exchange with the environment, sensitivity and cell-to-cell -cell communication, adhesion, and structural support. With regards to physical isolation, it will form, as you can imagine, this physical barrier that will separate the inside of the cell from the surrounding extracellular fluid. With regards to regulation of exchange with the environment, well, it is not everything that a cell wants to have inside of it, and it is not everything that a cell wants to allow to go inside of it. Therefore, the plasma membrane will control the entry of ions and nutrients, and in exchange, it will eliminate waste products and also release certain secretory products through the secretory vesicles. With regards to sensitivity, since the plasma membrane is the most external part of the cell, it will be the first part that will be affected by any changes that might occur in the extracellular fluid or the extracellular environment, and it will also contain a variety of specialized neuronal structures known as receptors. And these receptors will be the ones that will allow the cells to recognize and then respond to specific molecules that will bind to those receptors. And as you can imagine, any alteration in the plasma membrane will affect all of the cellular activities. And lastly, we have the cell-to-cell -cell communication, adhesion, and structural support. So for the cells to be able to communicate with each other, they need to be close by to each other, in the proximity of each other, and this proximity is set by specialized connections between neighboring cell membranes, or even between the plasma membrane and the extracellular materials. And by keeping them all together, it will also give that structural support that is important to the stability of a tissue. Remember that when several cells come together, they will form a tissue. Now, the fluid mosaic model of a cell membrane will describe the structure of the cell membrane as a dynamic, flexible structure that's made up of different components. And the two main components of the cell membrane are the phospholipids and proteins. Cholesterol will be embedded in the membrane and it will work as an essential building block which will help regulate the membrane fluidity. And according to this fluid mosaic model, the proteins and the lipids are free to move within the double layer of the phospholipids. Now we do say that the plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, right? You probably heard of this. And what does this mean? If we just break down the words, this tells us that this structure is made up of phospholipid, which we can see the structure of a phospholipid right over here. And it also has two layers. And this is what bilayer means. And we can see this clearly from this image. We have two rows of all these phospholipids arranged side by side, correct? When we look at the phospholipid structure forming the cell membrane, it will have what we call a head, which is this rounded structure, and a tail, which are these two strands that hang from the head. Now the head is considered what we call hydrophilic, and the tail is hydrophobic. And what does this tell us? Well, if we break down the words again, hydro means what? Well, it means water. So both have water in them. And philic means affinity. And phobic means aversion to something. In other words, the head has affinity or likes water. 
and the tail has aversion or dislikes water. Therefore, we can also say that the head is polar and the tail is nonpolar. And this characteristic where a component has a polar and nonpolar component is termed amphipathic. From this image, we can also see that the heads are facing away from each other and the tails are therefore facing towards each other, right? See the yellow heads are going to be all aligned on the outside of the cell and then again on the inside of the cell where we find the cytoplasm. And the tails are going to be facing each other in the middle of this bilayer, correct? And this arrangement is important because it allows the cell to be selective permeable, meaning that it only lets certain substances in and out of the cell. It actually prevents large molecules or charged molecules like ions from diffusing directly across the membrane without the use of a channel. And this is where all of these other components of the cell membrane come in to help select what will be entering into the cell and what will be leaving the cell. So let's take a closer look at them in the next few slides. Let's start with the proteins. There are two general types of membrane proteins, the peripheral proteins and the integral proteins. The peripheral proteins, like the name says, they will be only on the periphery, meaning that they are going to be attached to either the inner or outer membrane surface. And this will depend on their function. An example would be the glycoproteins. The integral proteins, which can also be called the transmembrane proteins, also like the name says, they will cross the phospholipid bilayer. And this is because trans means across or on the other side of. Therefore, it will go from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell across the cell membrane. Now, some integral proteins, they form channels that will let water molecules, ions, and small water-soluble substances into or out of the cell. And this means that the communication between the interior and exterior of the cells will occur through these channels. An example will be a carrier protein. Now, other channels are what we call gated channels, meaning that they will have like a gate that opens and closes. And this will allow for regulation of material that is wanting to pass through them. Examples of gated channels are ligand-gated ion channels and voltage-gated ion channels where ligand-gated ion channels open when a chemical ligand, such as a neurotransmitter, binds to the protein, and a voltage-gated ion channels, they will open and close in response to changes in the membrane potential. Now, because of the membrane's fluidity, these integral proteins are actually able to move within the membrane, like floats on a swimming pool. Now, these alpha helical integral membrane proteins, they do play essential roles in biochemical and electrical signal transduction, also in molecular transport and energy propagation, among other critical cellular processes across the membrane. And because they go from one side of the membrane to the other, they are considered integral proteins. Moving on to the glycolipids, the inner and outer surfaces of the plasma membrane, they will differ in protein and lipid composition. The carbohydrate, which is the glyco component of the glycolipids, and glycoproteins that extend away from the outer surface of the plasma membrane form this very viscous superficial coating that's known as the glycocalyx. And some of these molecules, they function as receptors. So when a membrane receptor binds to a specific molecule in the extracellular fluid, the membrane receptor will trigger a change in the cellular activity. 
Now the main function of a glycolipid is to maintain the stability of the cell membrane and glycolipids are also important for cell recognition and for connecting cells to form tissues. With regards to sterols, they stabilize the membrane structure and they also help to regulate the membrane fluidity, the permeability and the rigidity. They also play an important role in membrane remodeling as part of this biological process, such as endocytosis, which we will see later on. The most common sterile in the plasma membrane of human cells is cholesterol. An interesting function of cholesterol has to do with its functions during changes in temperature. So when the temperatures drop and it becomes really cold, there is going to be an increase in the number of cholesterol in between the phospholipids. And you can see from the image how cholesterol is arranged within those phospholipids. And what this does is that it creates bigger spaces in the plasma membrane. And by creating bigger spaces, there is an increase in the fluidity of the plasma membrane. And the opposite is true as well. Therefore, when the temperatures are extremely hot, cholesterol is able to decrease the plasma membrane fluidity. And this occurs because the increased energy from the heat causes its molecules to move more rapidly, and this restricts their ability to flow past one another, therefore decreasing the fluidity of the plasma membrane. Let's talk a little bit about cholesterol synthesis. So cholesterol levels in the body, they come from two main sources, either dietary intake or biosynthesis, which means that it is produced in our body. In fact, the majority of cholesterol utilized by healthy adults is going to be synthesized in the liver, which produces approximately 70% of the total daily cholesterol requirement. The other 30% comes from dietary intake. Of course, there are sources of good and bad cholesterol, but we will not get into this. Also, the synthesis of cholesterol is a complex process, and we will also not cover this in our lab. What we can cover is where cholesterol is synthesized or produced, which, like I already mentioned, is in the liver by a set of enzymes from the fat in our diet. And one of these enzymes is HNG-CoA reductase, that when active, produces a lot of cholesterol in certain conditions much beyond the natural needs of the body. And the bad part of it is that the excess cholesterol has been shown to cause several health conditions, including blockage of blood vessels and heart attack. Therefore, there has been extensive studies to find an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor that can effectively block the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase that is responsible for synthesizing cholesterol in the liver. And these classes of drugs are called statins, which will competitively inhibit the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. They do this by binding to the active site of the enzyme and changing its structure. And as the structure of the enzyme is changed, it cannot bind with the receptor. Thus, its activity is going to be reduced, and this then reduces the production of cholesterol. So these will be the main components of the plasma membrane, and in the next few slides, we will cover a few more organelles that don't have a membrane. So we refer to them as a non-membranous organelle. The cells, they will maintain its shape through what we call a cytoskeleton, the cytoskeleton includes the thread-like microfilaments, which are made mainly of a protein called actin. In terms of functions, the microfilaments, they will anchor the cytoskeleton of proteins of the plasma membrane, more specifically the integral proteins, which we talked already about. And this helps to stabilize the position of these membrane proteins. 
it also strengthens the cell and attaches the plasma membrane to the underlying cytoplasm. Also, the actin microfilaments, they will interact with other microfilaments or larger structures composed of the protein myosin, for example. And this interaction allows part of the cell to move, or it actually allows changes to the shape of the entire cell. The other component of the cytoskeleton are the microtubules, which are these thin, hollow tubes. And like the name says, microtubules, small tubes. Makes sense, right? And these tubes are built from the protein tubulin. With regards to the functions of microtubules, there are several, as they form the main components of the cytoskeleton, giving the cell strength and rigidity and anchoring major organelles. They also allow cells to change the shape and they may help the cell to move. And because they attach to organelles, they help these move around the cell. They will also have an important role during cell division, which we will talk more when we cover this topic. And lastly, microtubules form structural components of organelles such as centrioles, cilia, and flagella, which we will see on the next slide. Therefore, a centriole is going to be the cylindrical structure that's composed of short microtubules that are organized Notice how they are not scattered throughout the cell. They actually form nine groups of microtubules and they will always be paired within a cell, meaning that there are always two centrioles, as we see here on this image. And they will be found in a specific region of the cytoplasm that is always close to the nucleus and it's known as the centrosome. Also notice how they are arranged at right angles of each other. And this disposition is going to be important to move the chromosomes into opposite directions within the cell during cell division. And lastly, we're going to be talking about the cilia and the flagella. So some cells, they have these unique features. So for example, the cells in the respiratory system, they are going to be lined with the cilia. And these are these microscopic hair-like projections that can move in waves. This feature helps trap inhaled particles in the air and will expel them when you cough, for example. And we will talk more about this when we do get to the respiratory system. And the other unique feature is the flagella. Some bacteria have flagella, as we can see here from this image. And a flagellum is like a little tail that can help a cell move or propel itself. And the only human cell that has a flagellum is a sperm cell, where we can see clearly on this image here below.